how it works. Yeah, okay. So what I want to talk about now is just mostly making sure we are on the same page and kind of say what I think synthetic algebraic geometry is. Hi. Um, yeah, and then give some overview of the history, kind of what happened so far. Yeah. Uh, maybe we complete our round of introductions, which we had earlier, so maybe not repeating it, but I don't know you. Uh, I am Rohan Linge. Yeah, I'm from the University of Amsterdam. I couldn't find the building source. Yeah, that's completely understandable. Yeah. And you know, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, happy. So many people, and you can make it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm Louis Foucault. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had some street. Yeah. Um, I'm in Berlin. Uh, yeah, please do it all. Okay. Um, I just start with my. Usual bubble picture. So, so what is this? Right? Mm. Yeah. So, I would say, in like one sentence, it's the study of one particular corpus uh, by its internal language. And with one particular purpose, I mean actually many, because there's some parameter which is some ring we start with. And what we need to construct this topos is a cheese of some side. So this is some ring. And then we take K algebras, which are finitely presented. Don't worry too much if you don't know what these words mean. That will come up a bit more in the later introductory lectures. And there's some property topology in that. And this gives you a purpose, which is a special kind of category and which contains kind of all the objects you are interested in in algebraic geometry. And well, what are those? So you have schemes which contain varieties. So I mean, examples would be something like similar defined space, protected space, and uh, the this thing will contain more. So there are a couple of standard ways of constructing collections, for example, like the natural numbers or something like this, you usually have in your set theory, which now when we work in SAG synthetically or internal, we do in this topos. So they are in some sense slightly different, but kind of feel the same. So a bit further away, we have also some object like the naturals. So maybe that's do some trouble around that. So this is this thing. And uh, you also have something like the one element set or the empty set, but those actually happen to be schemes. So maybe the picture is something like this. And uh, what is a bit of a twist of the subject which uh, we kind of introduced when I when we were when we started here in Gothenburg to talk about synthetic algebraic geometry, which is to use uh, something like a higher topos here, or more precisely a model of homotopy type theory or cubical homotopy type theory. So the also, don't worry if you know, don't know what that means. So, I mean, I guess in general, I should say that we have a lot of subjects intersection, intersecting in this area. And 
I mean, this is kind of demanding because you have to understand all of them a bit at some point, but on the other hand, it's liberating because it's clear that nobody can master all the subjects, so you can always feel free to ask basic questions about any of them. So that's what you should do. And uh, okay, so what this means is that we also have something called higher types, which I just mentioned briefly. So if you have read the hot book, then you know there's some high inductive circle, and it's also something we have in this corpus on of type theory. And these schemes are contained in something which is called zero types or sets in the hot book. And uh, these things mix. So for example, you have a construction which takes a group and turns it into a higher type such that its group space, its identity type at some given point will be uh, the group again of so-called identity plane spaces. And you can take a scheme, which is a group, and do this construction and get some higher type which mixes like both words, like the higher stuff and the scheme stuff. And this is something quite important that we can do it. So this is something I will give an introductory lecture tomorrow when this comes up. So one important point where this is really important is cohomology. Okay, so how do we work with this? We, as I said, it's a model of type theory. So this is the language we use. So we have a model of type theory, but as you might have heard, this is usually interpreted in something called homotopy types or infinity group points. And this is actually not what we want. So, or what we want to think of when we use hot to talk about these things. And uh, to make it more specific about this one, we use a couple of axioms and data, or you could call them principles because they are known to hold some model. And uh, well, the first is just a datum, which is a ring. And this is A1 in here, happens to be that one. So we have some internal ring, and then we have three axioms, which we will learn about later today, what they are exactly. Yeah, and that's it. And uh, here, this doesn't work, at least classically, I know it kind of can't work. And here, you know, these axioms are modeled. So, and uh, the point of the whole thing is that algebraic geometry gets easier, and also a point at least for some people, is that it becomes constructive. So, yeah. And yeah, now I want to just give an overview of what happened in the more distant past and what happened very recently. So, uh, question. Yeah. What was again the blackboard A and P? Ah, so the A is called a fine space. So that's like a vector space, or oh, it feels like it. It's not exactly a vector space, I would say. And the PN is productive space. So this is where you add infinitely distant points to AN in some specific way. But we will learn about both of them later. Okay, so. Let me check the clock.
Maybe that's a bit much. It's a history of some subject. <laughs> and it's not really so old yet, but I think there's some kind of prehistory or history which is actually quite old already. So I would say it starts in the 70s. So, I mean, that's something I would really call prehistory, but it kind of fits into um, what we do, at least in intention. So in the 70s, there was this idea by Kopenick that algebraic geometry uh, should be done more internally. So, I mean, you might know this school of algebraic geometry where you uh, start with topological space and put some data on it, like achieve, and some atlas or some very specific things. And there the idea was uh, to um, work more category theoretic and my preferred of the factor points approach. And uh, so Monique Hakim did a PhD thesis with Brodnick and worked in a focus or category which is ringed. And uh, the idea was to develop algebraic geometry as abstractly as possible and with internal categorical principles. So I haven't really read this, but I know that Ingo Blechmet, who will come up later in this history overview, he cited her as some important source. And I mean, what I want to say with this point is that in the background, there was this idea in the algebraic geometry community, at least in a small part of it, uh, which kind of goes in the same direction. And what is actually pretty close to what we uh, do today was work by Anders Fock. The name you might know from synthetic differential geometry. And uh, I would say uh, some things he did actually are synthetic algebraic geometry already. So he's uh, already using uh, two of our axioms, which we use today more or less. So it's still a bit more external to us. So it's not quite the same, but he just goes on and does some calculation that I needed to understand. Protective space internally does it already kind of in the same way we do it today. And I mean, synthetic differential geometry, which is a lot older and there was a lot more work on in the past, and the algebraic variant is, uh, is very much in the spirit of, same spirit of what we do. Yeah. Okay, and I mean, after that, uh, I mean, under the pop continued, as far as I know, at least with synthetic differential geometry, but specifically algebraic, there's, uh, I would say, kind of almost nothing, as far as I know, it's correct for something like 40 years. So, yeah. And, uh, but one should say specific. So that's no G. But I mean, what happened is uh, that a couple of tools and topics in mathematics came up that are very relevant for how we do things now. Uh, so, uh, uh, I would say tools or languages which we use today. So, I mean, starting in the 70s, there was, uh, it came to be Martin Loeb type theory, which is, uh, the basis for homotopy type theory, which we 
use now. And uh, in mathematics more, so also in algebraic geometry and related areas, um, I cheese uh, and can see. So higher these or categories in general or hypothesis. And uh, I mean, later, like after 2010 or something like this, we have come up with type series, which is mostly explained as being an internal language of infinity group points, or I guess that's what you here first, but you can also view it as a language for hypothesis. And the idea we use to get cohomology in the end is actually built on things from this area that higher sheaves became something important in mathematics. And that's again, like in the 80s, Rodenberg wrote pursuing stacks. So a stack is some higher sheaf. And when you read this, I mean, from my bias perspective now, it sounds a lot like uh, he, he wants something like what we are doing now. So that's kind of a good sign, I would say. And But it also tells us that uh, what we do now doesn't come from nothing, but there are developments in the background which pushed the technology and concepts he used. Okay, and yeah, what happened next is that Ingo Blechnet wrote a thesis and published in 2017. I don't know when he started. So, uh, and uh, this is already quite close also what we do today, but still a bit different. So if you look into it, you might be confused when you try to match it up with what, with what we do here. Uh, so this thesis, so he didn't only do his thesis on SAG, uh, so to say, but also some other things, which I might mention later, but his thesis, uh, contains two big parts. And the first one is on the little risky focus. And the second one, maybe it's part three. I, I'm not sure, but I mean, you can divide the thesis in these two parts. And this one, so you have to scroll down a lot when you read his thesis to get to a place that's about the same things we are talking about. So this, I would say, is SAG in our sense here. Uh, but there are also good reasons to call this a synthetic theory of algebraic geometry. It's just in some different sense. So I mean, just to give you some idea, here he starts with a, top, a scheme at the topological space and looks at the topos of sheaves of sets on that. And here you start with a Groton type uh, site, which uh, contains all the affine schemes you want to talk about. And then you talk about the theory of all of those. And you can still be confused, I guess, because he uses the Zariski topos over some base scheme. And often when he phrases things, uh, it's about the base scheme and not about schemes in this topos. So this is the shift of perspective that can get you confused. So maybe that helps if you want to look up something there and compare what we have here. Also, his notion of quasi-coherence, which was very important, I would say, uh, which he called synthetic quasi-coherence, 
is about sheaves of modules over the base of the service key corpus. And we will talk here about some notion of quasi coherence, which is about sheaves on schemes. So, more remarks for the experts. And um, yeah, so after that, I mean, Ingo continued to do stuff. For example, he wanted to get to define cohomology and things like this. Uh, but I want to highlight something else that happened around the time, as far as I know. Um, they would just Myers um, use what? So something from Ingo. So here, Ingo had in some way already, or in a really good way, I would say he had from our three axioms, he had one and two. Uh, the second one he called synthetic quasi coherence. We try to call it something else by now, duality, but that's still up for debate. Right? But uh, he had a more general version. And what David just Myers did was he took some kind of simple case from that, which we also use today, and also took this axiom, which says your ring is local. and used both in homotopy type theory, used these axioms in homotopy type theory. And uh, David already had a lot of uh, things going, so he reproduced a couple of proofs of Ingo, and he was trying to do something in the direction of A1 homotopy theory, and yeah, actually had a couple of interesting proofs, but never continued with it. Uh, but I mean, uh, for me, it was very important because I met with him a couple of times during the time and he explained to me how to do this. I mean, I also wanted to do this, but he was just a lot quicker in extracting what you, how you can use in your setup and what and how you should do things. He explained this to me and we worked a bit together, but there were no publications or anything like that about that. And uh, so the next step is kind of uh, a bit into my postdoc here. Uh, I worked with Thierry Coco in the back and uh, Matthias Hutzler, who sadly can't join us this time for the workshop. Um, and uh, introduced something which we call foundation. SAG. And uh, one new thing is the third axiom, which I mean, on its own, is, I guess, not impressive to just have more axioms. But uh, it allowed us to do something, namely to compute cohomology groups. How to define them is more or less obvious if you know the story from higher topo theory, how you can do cohomology there. And it's kind of, yeah, it's not completely clear what to do actually, but we did something, some of the things you can do turned out to be really great and that's what we did. So yeah, cohomology. And, uh, from the third axiom, which was introduced for cohomology, we also were able to produce a very nice notion of open subset. So that was something where I got one idea from Ingo. I just asked him, how would you define open? And he gave me two answers, and I took the simple one I understood, and so that's what we tried. And uh, with this axiom, you could show that uh, what you define for a big open subset is the same as what we can define in some sense point-wise. 
or in some internal sense, it's kind of literally pointwise, can define openness of a subset. And uh, this turned out to be very useful. I mean, I highlight open networks the same for closed and similar for other stuff. But uh, this was important because it allows you to say scheme in a nice and useful way. And I think this is already something uh, where at least I am kind of happy or I find it easier, a lot easier than defining scheme and some categorical or functorial approach to algebraic geometry. So, I mean, the cohomology is also nice, but I mean, this is maybe quite convincing because it's really a basic notion and it's kind of hard and not so clear to define it in the functorial or categorical approach to algebraic geometry. Okay, and uh, I mean, at the time when that happened, and later, uh, I guess something I want to say here is also, I mean, here, before, like, in the history, you see only kind of one person, at least here, as far as I know, only one person worked on things, and here we are three, and I think it was really important that we have people with different backgrounds, because, yeah. I don't know, it spreads a lot within topics. And, you know, for example, it was very nice that Thierry could check our third axiom in a cubicle model. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't have known how to do at all. You know. uh, this axiom is also, it looks a bit sketchy at first sight, I would say. So I wasn't convinced it was true, so I wasn't completely convinced. Matthias wasn't convinced at all at first, and so, and I guess it's justified, so it's a bit unclear, so it was important to be able to check if this actually works. Okay, and uh, yeah, also in 2023, I think I'm actually not sure, David, Joined working on SHG, maybe already in late 2022. I'm not sure. Everything. Okay. And uh, later, in February, I guess, we both joined. I can write your name. I'm very slow. I'm very slow. <laughs> Um, but no one can read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and Hugo, both joined, I mean, we go a bit later. And that was really great because, I mean, from here on, uh, it expanded a lot what we know. And uh, yeah, to change boards. So, I mean, what, I mean, from now on, we kind of more or less worked all together on the topic. And for example, what uh, almost alone, I guess, David did was um, proving some result about homology, which you could call the fine managing. So just summarized like this. And um, I mean, we were trying to do this in the end of the foundation thing. And uh, I developed some technology and some category of modules which should make this work and actually did. But like David uh, saw how to put things together and get the proof of this which is completely internal. So we were already here with thinking maybe it doesn't work internal. We have to assume some external natural numbers and things like this to do it at all. But yeah, this was very nice. And 
what uh, let me look up the order in which I run to save things. Ah, but happened a bit later and was also nice, even though it doesn't really have an application yet, is that we figured out how one can define pro proper schemes. We are not completely sure this is the right way because we haven't used it anywhere, I guess, or not too much at least. So, uh, and I mean, the definition that turned out to work reasonable well is not so hard to come up with. So I think that's something I suggested. And so you say your proper scheme is separated. And compact. And both mean something simple. So this just means identity types are closed for all points x, y in the scheme. And this means for all open subsets, the proposition that the openness of all space is open, which is a very weird condition, I guess, if you come from classic algebraic geometry. But uh, that actually is a known concept of compactness from uh, synthetic topology. And uh, the interesting thing was for this that we could actually prove their interesting examples. So that's the part that David get, uh, proved together with Thierry, I think. Um, not sure anymore, but yeah, there's one big proof, and uh, that's quite complicated, I would say, algebraically and even constructively. And yeah, so that's interesting to have. And in parallel, we had a project, I guess, where Hugo did most of the work, which was on uh, FPAL and smooth schemes. So uh, it turns out that it's reasonable. And I think that's the most surprising way to phrase it is that a scheme is et al if for all closed dense propositions. Don't worry, things will be introduced later. So it's just for our view. So if for all dense, uh, closed dense propositions, you can, so closed dense kind of means you have a closed subset of the point, which is almost the point. And the interesting thing is that if you say you can extend all those kind of slightly below the sub point subsets to a full point, then you have an et al scheme. So if you have this lifting diagram, so to say, for, for those propositions, then uh, the scheme is et al. And what was really something which Hugo proved, which was really better than I expected, is that this is equivalent to oh, this is for x is scheme. This is equivalent to x is locally standard et al, which means you have locally a very concrete description. Like you know locally it's a fine, uh, like a portion of the fine plane by some very of the zeros of some very specific polynomials. And uh, I mean, this kind of justifies then this internal definition, which kind of started as an experiment. And uh, yeah, there's a similar result for smoothness. So these things were very nice. And I mean, one reason for telling you this history and here with these details about series is, uh, 
we don't cover all of that like in the workshop. I mean, not in the introductory lectures and uh, even if we fill the program with all these things, we cannot cover them in detail. So I just want to mention a couple of things that happened and I think were important. So you can also ask people about it or if you really want to know one of them, we might be able to make some session on them. Yeah. Something like that. Okay, and uh, I mean, this happened, started to happen around the time of this foundations thing and extended like until a couple of months ago, I guess, most of those things. And later we had meetings, uh, for example, one year ago, um, I, it gets a bit confusing with who the what now, but it's written down who's the author of which of the drafts on our web page, which correspond to it. But uh, with, so it was me with David and Ingo. Um, there was some justification of the cohomology condition. So uh, one classification, I guess, is uh, check cohomology, which gives you a formula for calculating cohomology, which uh, is the same formula as classically. So you know you kind of get the same results as in classic algebraic geometry, which is important to know that. Uh, I mean, it's not completely the same, and it can't be because our cohomology and the coefficients we use, it's all suddenly different in a couple of ways. But this kind of tells you some really important basic examples agree. And uh, what also happened, and which is uh, from David and Ingo, is uh, something, some theory called SEA finance, which tells you if, so it's kind of an inverse of that one. If you know that uh, higher cohomology vanishes, then you know a scheme is a fine. And curiously, you actually only have to check it for the first cohomology. But yeah. And there's also some some justification that you can see that you can use cohomology in some way, actually. Okay. Uh, and something that happened one meeting later, so that was in Augsburg. And I mean, it happened before and after the meeting as well is that Peter Arndt from some of us uh, on uh, about a one homology theory. So I would say there are some interesting results which reproduce classic knowledge, but uh, for the really interesting part, it's not clear because we use some assumption, so which we don't know if it's justified. So this is kind of the state of status of that. But yeah, but I would say even the part before the assumption is already quite interesting. So a one homotopy theory, if you don't know it, is kind of taking ideas from algebraic topology, one could naively say, and transporting it to algebraic geometry. So you want to have some concept of homotopy, but uh, what we get doesn't really look so similar to uh, algebraic topology most of the time. So it's a lot more complicated and subtle and you have way more possibilities. So, yeah. Yeah, but that's also some interesting direction. And I mean, Hugo will also tell you about Atal Shis, so I'm not mentioning it here now. It's 
also something interesting and something which also doesn't really have applications yet, but I think will have at some point is algebraic stacks, which was also done mostly by Hugo. So we have definitions for that, um, like for the linear manifold stack, if it tells you something in uh, the stack, I guess we call it the other one. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of things work nice here, but uh, I mean, the real examples of stacks are very complicated constructions. So we have to advance all the rest before we can try that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, most recently, but it's something Thierry will talk about later at the workshop. Uh, there were some results on line bundles on projective space and automorphisms, which are in the generality classically hard to do, but uh, yeah, that looks quite nice. And is also an application of using higher types and being in a dependent type theory, which make this, I would say, a lot more pleasant than the classical story. Okay, that's actually all I wanted to say. Oh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so because uh, thanks for so for the introduction. So you mentioned you put all this on one tuples, right? Yeah. And and you mentioned several uh, examples for to go to higher higher infinity, like with the computer cohomology and this result of high models. But um, is there more like this is a very practical way of saying okay? We can do this and that by like going to infinity higher types, but do we have a more foundational or geometric picture of why? Like, what's the difference between the one purpose and a SAG and the maybe using um, um Wait a second. Hmm. I mean, um, for the cohomology, for example, as I said, we later found out, ah, you can use check cohomology. So that also tells us you could have used check cohomology as a definition, which you can do in a one purpose. So you don't need the higher types. And I guess, it might be like that for a couple of things. Um, so for some things, it's really just convenience, but I would argue it's a lot of convenience. Like uh, when you define cohomology using higher types, you immediately know it's well-defined. And here, you don't know it all. Like you would have to check something really bad, like you have to check it doesn't depend on the cover of your space. And I think that's, yeah. So in that case, it's convenience, but I don't know if it's always about convenience. And I'm not completely sure that was the direction of your question. Maybe you want to know something more philosophical. In general, yeah. Asking about the difference. Yeah, we'll look. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, you, there's a relationship between the one source and the infinity source. One is the sets of the other, and the, I think in this case, the infinity source is the um, universal one that is, you get by taking infinity sheets in the one source. So, uh, in that case, you do recover all the, the, the higher topos theory from the one source. But we don't know how to do that inside the part. So it's nice to have the hard available, mm. uh, even if we if you could do that, that could do that. But it, it does tell you that in some sense it's convenience, even though it's a lot of convenience. And even for expressivity, because we don't know how to express the highest cost inside the lot, and we feel this nicely. So mm. 
Yes. That works. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. If there aren't any more questions, then let's have a. Well, I have a comment, oh, maybe. Yeah, a comment. Like, like I guess so. So, um, I mean, you, you didn't name the axiom, the third one, it's a risky choice. Mm -hmm. But um, so I wonder um, how, whether it is actually implied by, by the cohomology results, like vanishing. So, I mean, could we rephrase it that, that certain cohomology groups like, like these on affine space vanish? Uh, my intuition says no, because it's so general. Thank you. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it does. No. Yeah, I, I was curious about that because our speech choice quantifies over like arbitrary affines, whereas so this cohomology results only to account. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you need, yeah. You, need, you, need, you need a bit more. That's but, uh, true. But the question, yeah, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think there's a related result, but I don't recall it by Andreas Blass, who showed that if cohomology vanishes with some certain coefficients, you already have choice in your topos. But I don't know in which framework he did exactly ah, okay, yeah, that, no, but yeah, so. he worked on that. So maybe there's some answer. Okay. Thank you. We meet again at 11. Uh, this room, I mean, so we have to take out our. Yeah,